Good morning and welcome to the TXPSN online learning conference. We're glad you could join us for this session. Education is none of your business presented by Chris Shade. This session will run until 11.30 a.m. Central Time. I'm your host, Kayla Platt. Our facilitator is Joe Claire Hall and our captionist is Andrea Colbert. To view the captions, open to the Windows tab at the upper left and select Show Closed Captioning or use hotkey control F8. Sign language interpretation is provided by hired hands. Please notice the participant window to the left of your screen. Here you'll find the buttons to raise your hand, respond to polling, and use emoticon. The chat window is where you can ask questions during the presentation. Please note that moderators will be able to view all chat comments. Finally, the talk button in the upper left section of your screen can be used if you have a microphone and there is an opportunity to use it during the presentation. It will be blue when your microphone is live. And now I'm going to hand it over to our presenter, Chris. Good morning, everyone. I trust that you've had a remarkable, engaging conference uh, these past few days. And I am excited to be here to uh, close this off for you. One of the things that has always been important to me is to make sure I cover the question of why. And so often in education, we get to the, the what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and we leave out the why. So I'd like to begin uh, my talk there this morning with uh, why we uh, do things. But, you know, it, it, it gets me to thinking. So if the number two pencil is the most popular in the world, why is it still number two? Why questions I have are things like if 7-Eleven is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, why do they have locks on the doors? Now, when it comes to buying candy, why do they call that little bitty Snickers the fun size and really I think it's the big one that's the most fun to have? And when I was a kid, I remember watching Wiley e. Coyote wondering if he had all of that money to buy those Acme things, why didn't he just go buy dinner? Other why questions, have you ever been to the ballpark? We go out and sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game when we're already there. And perhaps my most perplexing question is, why is there Braille at a drive-up ATM? I don't know the answer to these questions. Why do we spend the first two years of a child's life teaching them to talk and to walk and the rest of their life to sit down and shut up? Why? Why are these questions here? And why, my question today, is education gotten so stressful? I think that there's a variety of answers. One, I think, starts with the bureaucracy. I found some very interesting articles uh, just this morning uh, talking about bureaucracy and um, particular to standardized assessment. I posted those to my Twitter page, at Under Whose Shade, uh, which is my uh, blog site, and uh, hopefully will generate some uh, some good discussion. But you know, our government and our policymakers, in an effort to correct what they perceive as inefficiency and ineffectiveness in public education, have really gone to over mandating and over regulation, uh, and we've created a system nationwide with multiple and punitive accountability uh, systems to ensure that compliance. And I think that has created a ton of stress for our uh, educators today. I think that follows then with the stress of the number of state curricular standards. It's been shown in research that it would take us from grades K to 22 to really cover all of the content that we're required to cover in education today. For teachers, it always feels like spinning plates and there's one more thing that has to be done without ever removing one or more of the plates from before. And that becomes quite stressful in education as well. And of course, high stakes testing uh, have really hindered the things that has made America great. And those are the things that I want to talk about today as we move forward with perhaps some new ideas and solutions and ways to go about our education system. But as we continue to see, 
with the recently passed Every Student Succeeds Act, we continue to get more of the same, more of the same emphasis on standardized assessment. And that leads to, again, the question of why. I was in a conference in Austin recently with Sir Ken Robinson, who shared the following mind-blowing statistic. Last year, the NFL was a $9 billion industry. He shared that Hollywood was an $11 billion industry. When it came to standardized assessment, standardized assessment is a $16 billion industry. And that statistic just really hammers home uh, why I'm afraid that we continue to do this type of system when we know as educators weighing the pig won't make it fatter. So it's merely just like putting lipstick on the pig. So how did we get here? Why did we get here? Well, really, it all goes way back. America's schools were really not designed to teach all children to high levels. They were actually designed to select and sort young people into two groups, a small handful of thinkers and a great mass of doers. It goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, in fact. In his notes on the state of Virginia, uh, he had an the, uh, he proposed that we, uh, that we teach the three R's, the reading, the writing, and arithmetic to children for three years, gratis or free. And a visitor then was to choose the boy of the best genius in the school whose parents were too poor to provide an education and then send them forward to one of the 20 grammar schools for further teaching in more complex subjects. Now from there, the best genius was, in his words, raked from the rubbish. And they continued for six more years at public expense. And then at the end of that period, one half were discontinued and the other half would go on to William and Mary College. You know, this type of sorting and choosing continued until the turn of the century and the Industrial Revolution. And the country was really filling up with factories, and these factories needed workers. And as factories began to replace the farms as a primary workplace, uh, rural Americans then flocked to the cities where they were seeking greater comfort and security. But what they found was a regimented world that was closely monitored and tightly controlled and a system designed to, to have the maximum output actually turn human beings made of flesh and blood into machines. One would put on a door and turn a screw, put on the door, turn a screw, put on a door, and turn on a screw. They were paid to do exactly as they were asked to do, nothing more, nothing less. I think this is best captured in a video uh, that was uh, on one of the I Love Lucy episodes that I'll drop into the web tour line here. So join me with this. I think the key that you heard there in the end is Ethel, we're fighting a losing game. And I think that's where we find ourselves in education today. But even back then, there was a concern about the child uh, labor and that children were working in the factories. And you see the adults, they were, they were incensed. They said, children, they can't work in the factories. They're taking our jobs. So in essence, what happened is our factory owners insisted that losing child workers would be catastrophic and they couldn't afford to hire the adults. And so a deal was struck, 
uh, they were sold on this idea that children would actually be more prepared to be compliant, productive members of the workforce if they were educated to sit in rows, to follow rules, and do as they were told. You see, back then, mass education was designed to turn out adults who worked well within the system. The reality is, is that factories didn't happen because there were schools. Schools happened because there were factories. You know, when we think about factories, we often think of Henry Ford, Model T's, and the assembly line. Yet with the burgeoning success and growth that was happening, the need for a new type of worker was born, and that was that of the white-collar worker. Interestingly enough, however, these white-collar workers were still factory workers. Whether they were pushing a pencil or hammering away on a keyboard or calling on customers, the work was planned, it was controlled, it was measured, it was routinized. You see, the, the American dream promised that if you paid attention in school and you did your job well, you showed up on time, you didn't ask a lot of questions, then you were offered to be paid a sum of money, a generous sum of money, given job security, offered health insurance and retirement benefits. See, this was considered the American dream. You know, interestingly enough, my father worked in a factory in a white collar uh, in sales. So every morning he would fight Houston traffic going from one place of business to another, and he'd meet with an office manager and ask, what paper products do you need? Paper towel, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, chemicals. And he'd take the order, he'd get back in his car, and he'd drive to another place of business, a church or a school. Uh, what paper products do you need? Paper towel, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, chemicals, he would ask. So he was extremely talented and very successful uh, in his work. But as business continued to boom, wealth and prosperity <laughs> began to, uh, to continue to grow. And madmen, advertisers, began to tell us the things that we were missing in our lives. There was abundance, and uh, for the first time, we began to experience abundance, and material possessions became then the signpost of success. Bigger houses or fancier cars, or as Brad Pitt said in Fight Club, uh, advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't really like. But economic disparity continued to grow. And I can't think of a better one to describe, although highly edited um, for your listening pleasure in this education venue, uh, George Carlin's take on the American dream that I'd like to drop now into the web tour. Everyone will have to press play on their own screen. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, and we're back. Wow, uh, he's really uh, spoke uh, well to to that topic and in, in our uh, move that uh, really uh, took us to a, a model of, of consumerism. And, and the interesting thing, though, is as our world began to experience the new technologies that we have available to us today, that old American dream really began to collapse. Uh, jobs that um, could be routinized or done cheaper were uh, shipped overseas. Um, and the fact came in that uh, things like what my father used to do uh, in eight hours a day, uh, I could do today in just a manner of, of minutes. I read an article by Tony Wagner uh, recently that was uh, that was quite interesting, and certainly will provide some of the uh, background of, of some of what I'm uh, going to share today. But he uh, went on to say that our consumer society is uh, bankrupt; it's not coming back. And the suggestion that we've got to move away from this consumer-driven society to one of creation. I think that's where the point really comes in and hits home with the work that we're doing here today and the, the, the sessions that have been discussed uh, over the past few days is really uh, our knowledge that we need to begin to create because knowledge uh, today is ubiquitous, is constantly changing, uh, it's everywhere, and uh, it's uh, compared to air and water. We have access um, to that uh, so so much so. An interesting fact that uh, that I uncovered was what's called the knowledge doubling curve. You see, back um, prior to uh, around 1900, knowledge was thought to double every century, and then as we moved uh, forward uh, around the end of World War II, it was thought to be doubling uh, every 25 years. Today, it's thought to be doubling uh, almost uh, every 12 hours, and that's the type of rapid change that's happening in our world today. You see, there's no competitive advantage in knowing more than the next person. It's a matter of knowing what to do with that information. I love the quote by George Kiros when he said, if I can Google your questions, your questions suck. I think it's so uh, appropriate, uh, well, somewhat inappropriate, but perfect because so many people fear the use of technology because they say things like, well, kids will uh, copy the answers or they'll go to Google and figure it out. I think that's where we've got to go above and beyond where we are and able to really uh, get to uh, our students to where they need to be in this uh, creation uh, economy. I'm going to slip back over then to the uh, to the web tour. I'm going to drop this in, make sure that you push play uh, to share a great video with you that demonstrates how uh, knowledge is uh, so different for our children today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I absolutely love that video. It's one of my favorites um, out there because it so captures um, where our children are, are coming uh, to us in, in school today. I love the quote from um, retired superintendent uh, Jeffrey Turner of Coppell who said, we can no longer operate a 19th century system using 20th century accountability and expecting uh, 21st century learners. And there's so much truth to that. And yet, uh, we find that folks sometimes will be resistant to change. And I love the quote, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So with that, there are five ways that Tony Wagner has uh, discussed that America's education uh, system is really stunting uh, innovation. So let's take a look at that. Number one, individual achievement is the focus. And school is really a, a competition amongst peers with students chasing uh, A's and GPAs. Uh, it's really more about individualization uh, than it is uh, what we need to be working with our kids to be a part of our workforce today um, for a great part. Uh, and that's to, um, is to work together and collaborate because innovation is a team sport. And problems today are, are too complicated to solve, really, by oneself. Secondly, the, the idea of specialization is uh, well over 125 years old. That system has been around since the so-called Committee of Ten made some specific decisions on how we would do education. Let me share that video with you. Make sure you press play. Okay, we're back, and that uh, really begins to uh, capture such a, a, a powerful statement that the system that we've been using is so outmoded and outdated, and yet we uh, we continue to uh, to work through that. Um, so again, instead of the idea of consumption uh, and looking more to the idea of, of innovation and creation, uh, innovation is really more cross-disciplinary uh, and involves solutions from, from multiple perspectives, not just one. So in the idea uh, that was developed uh, well over 100 years ago of teaching our classes in isolation where uh, math is taught for 45 minutes and uh, reading is taught for 45 minutes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there is so many opportunities out there for uh, cross-disciplinary uh, connections that, uh, that can be made. Uh, for our students, especially when we take on things like project-based learning, um, that it's not just isolated into individual units of time. You know, the third thing that we are dealing with in uh, education today, and really uh, a part of our greater society as a whole here uh, in our country, is uh, risk aversion. Um, and we penalize for mistakes. And um, we are so failure uh, adverse in uh, in our in, in our society, part of that uh, I believe uh, comes down to uh, the reality of this uh, hierarchy model that we've had, where the whole challenge of schooling is to figure out what the teachers want, and the teachers have to figure out what the superintendent wants, and the superintendent's got to figure out what the state wants, and it's this compliance-driven, risk-adverse culture, and quite frankly, it stinks. I think we have to take notes from uh, our groundbreaking. Uh, business leaders who uh, say things uh, like the general manager of IDEO fail often so you can succeed sooner because innovation is really grounded in the idea that taking risks are vital and um, and I love the uh, the mantra of fail early and fail often. I know most of the time my greatest lessons were actually learned in the times that I failed. 
in the Stanford Institute of Design, they have a motto that S is the new A. I really, really like that idea. The one thing that I don't care for is the idea that failure is not an option. Because I say this, if failure is not an option, then neither is success. And so I understand from where the quote came, and, and that was a life-threatening situation. But when applied to, to education, I, I just don't buy the concept that failure is not an option. We've got to teach our kids that it's okay to fail. It's okay to struggle. And that's one of the things that we uh, continue to hear more about um, today is the idea of mindset and perseverance and stick with itness through uh, failure. Uh, so many of our kids uh, today have been programmed to just shut down if they don't get to the exact right answer right away. I like the idea of thinking of it as an acrostic where fail is the first attempt in learning. So, again, going back to the consumer model of things, uh, learning has, has become passive. And for 13 years, we've, we've taught our kids to simply uh, consume information. And they're passive consumers that are checking out on us. Uh, whereas when we talk about innovation and, and creation, uh, it's really not about consumption. And, and what I find so intriguing, is, as I visited recently with a lot of uh, millennials, is uh, how frustrated they are with uh, societies it currently is and how much, uh, as, as a whole, uh, they're interested in, in giving back and to creating and to doing things with meaning and purpose, which I think begins to show the shift away from the idea of, of consumerism. And then finally, uh, our extrinsive incentives are, are driving learning. We're using carrots and sticks and A's and F's, and we continue to rely on that type of mindset. And, um, you know, for our youngest of innovators, many of you probably seen the uh, video on Kane's Arcade and uh, how he took a bunch of uh, uh, cardboard boxes and created an arcade out of it. If you've not seen the video, just Google uh, Kane's Arcade is a great little uh, video because it shows that kids can be really uh, intrinsically motivated um, when there aren't grade scales and reward systems. What's really so uh, interesting but also a little bit scary is I was a part of a, uh, a group of uh, panelists, if you will, recently at one of our high schools. And uh, the students were to identify uh, some type of uh, social issue uh, either at school or in uh, in the community, and uh, in uh, the, the the panelists and I were were divided. And we were essentially uh, it was almost like a Shark Tank, but we were to uh, give students feedback on their ideas, and it was so amazing that uh, that you could watch and see that the uh, the students were really wanting to, who had been trained for many years to do this, were sitting back wanting to know what's the right answer. Can it, can I just give you the right answer? And then it was. Uh, I saw a lot of students who were shutting down just wanting to get the project over with rather than tra taking it on uh, truly uh, as, a, as a motivating project. And I think it's just a, um, uh, just the result of, of our training for um, what we've been doing. I like this um, was um, shared. Uh, Sylvia Duckworth does a lot of creative um, slide uh, drawings or, or, or drawings uh, that I'm using as a slide. Uh, and things that we, we should be considering uh, trying from creating a class website or, or YouTube channels or a class Twitter. And uh, there's been some amazing things that I've seen teachers use, uh, such as uh, Instagram and some videos and things like that where they're communicating um, with, uh, with their parents. So uh, creating digital portfolios, that's a concept that I heard uh, uh, Alan November discuss when he talked about uh, the digital learning farm. Uh, what I find fascinating about uh, this concept is, is this. I read a book not too long ago, um, uh, All Joy and No Fun. It's a great book, and it's a, a book which is written from the perspective of how children impact parents. Now, usually we read books about how parents impact children and how we can be better parents, et cetera, et cetera. But this particular book was really taken from a different perspective. And one of the quotes that really resonated with me in that particular, in that particular book uh, was that uh, children are economically worthless but emotionally priceless. 
That's deep. Children are economically worthless, but emotionally priceless. priceless. Think back to the days of the farm uh, when children were contributors to the family economy. They had a role to play. They picked crops. Um, they took care of the animals. Uh, they uh, contributed to the uh, to the work of the family, just like these uh, kids in, uh, uh, on the screen here. They were economically contributing to the family. But in the days of today, with the unlimited technology, uh, the information that's out there, um, kids' contributions have really been reduced to maybe a few chores, maybe, uh, and, and doing their schoolwork. Uh, but what Alan November has suggested is, is going back to the, the days of the farm, but instead of uh, picking crops, uh, making contributions digitally to uh, make connections with uh, uh, folks uh, across the community or across the globe, helping to solve interesting problems, uh, coming up with solutions. Our kids have the ability to, to do that today. You know, Winston Churchill once said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And I think to where we find ourselves in uh, education uh, today, that is, uh, that's really so, so true that we know that there are some issues within our educational system that we would love to do something about. Uh, I recently uh, did a presentation for our school board. And it was on the Gifted and Talented program, a program that I supervise here in Denton ISD. And, um, and one of our board members said uh, in, in, in a comment about some of the curriculum and content we were teaching kids, oh, I'd love to be able to, uh, to see all of our kids do that. And, and my response to her was, and I believe this, that teachers would do that kind of teaching across the board uh, but as long as we're shackled to the standardized assessment of STAR, we're really bound. I found in one of the articles I mentioned earlier in uh, in the message here uh, was actually um, uh, posted a, a few years back, and it is quite interesting and, and frightening all at the same time. But a professor at the University of um, uh, Texas in Austin, I had done a research uh, looking at. The, uh, the correlation of STAR to, to what's taught in the classroom and, and, and in his research and his findings showed that really only 50% of what teachers teach in the classroom translate over to the STAR test uh, as they're assessed today, leaving what he concluded to be the other half to have to come from test prep material. Um, because as much as we want so many of our kids to be able to have good instruction and do project-based learning and translate that to the STAR, it doesn't always work that way, especially for some of our students of, of poverty. As I've watched uh, a school here locally who uh, began to explore the IB process and, and how they really uh, embraced that idea, but that it didn't translate to STAR scores. And, um, and I think then we've got to look at what benefit are we getting for our nearly hundred million dollars a school year uh, from these standardized assessments. You know, the interesting takeaway that I took from that particular um, research uh, is, the, is the fact that if 50% if of the content needs to come from test prep materials, and, and in order for students to be successful in STAR, and, and not all, but many of our kids have to see uh, the format in which they're assessed. And uh, so if 50% has to be found out that way, where do you get that information? Well, that's where that $16 billion quote uh, comes in because not only are uh, these uh, testing corporations um, producing the, uh, the test itself for great cost, uh, it also comes with the uh, test prep materials that are needed for students. And so I think it becomes an issue where we have really got to be informed and educated about uh, the, uh, the, these realities. A great article, again, I posted today on my Twitter, uh, was, uh, was uh, talking about the number of mistakes that have occurred this year in our uh, standardized assessment system and, and what it's putting our, uh, our students and our teachers, our districts uh, through as a result of, uh, of some of the errors. So I think it's bringing attention and I think we have an opportunity to really leverage uh, that and begin to get more people informed because Sir Ken Robinson, really one of my, my heroes in education, says, and, 
education can be encouraged from the top down, but it can only be improved from the ground up. One of the persons I also have a lot of uh, respect for is Diane Ravitz, one of the architects of No Child Left Behind, who years later has come out and said, we made a mistake. Uh, we should not have taken that as far as as what we did. And, and we've turned our students into really testing factories where um, that's um, been what they're, they're producing and what their output is. And uh, students are frustrated. Uh, and why it's partly why they're shutting down. So Rabbit says that um, parents are truly the sleeping giant. We saw that happen in Texas a few years ago when we reduced the number of end of course exams from 15 to 5. And I think that there continues to uh, be this uh, opportunity uh, for us as uh, as citizens, uh, as parents, as community members, and politicians, and, and, and quite frankly, as Americans, to embrace our moral obligation to take advantage of the rights that it was given to us by our founding fathers. We're seeing lots of people across the country banding together and impacting uh, this legislation. And I think we can't just afford to sit back and, and let things happen. I, I think we've got to make it happen. I think we've got to take action uh, to enable our children to have the educational freedom to become more than a cog in a machine to really be the creators of, of content rather than consumers. And I think that we're really at the cusp of this point in education. We're watching it um, perhaps, in, in my assessment, in its final days, as is. And I am personally am okay with that. I think that it is uh, a little bit frightening uh, to think of education completely changing as we know it. But I honestly don't think it was any more frightening than what the farmers felt at the turn of the century when folks left the farm for the factories. I'm sure that they thought at that turning point where families left the farms and went to this uh, new concept of the city that they probably thought the world was going to hell in a handbasket. And yet we entered into our most prosperous time as a nation. I think we're faced with that same opportunity to uh, be where we are today and hence why we've got to take the opportunity to embrace new ideas. I think of uh, things uh, today in, in some of our current educational structures uh, of things uh, like uh, we, we have our students uh, take an entire year of, uh, of content, whether they need it or not. Um, for some, uh, some students could have learned uh, algebra, for example, in, in two weeks. For me, that would have taken a little bit longer, probably about two years, and yet the student that could learn it in two weeks is forced to sit in an entire set of two, two semesters for that. And uh, I, I think we um, yeah, what do you got? See, it looks like uh, Born has asked a question. She said okay. that it appears that the Commission of Ed is looking at the issue and legislature will in January. Isn't Texas leading the way looking at the assessment? Yes, there, in fact, um, the, uh, the Texas Education Agency uh, recently sent out um, uh, a mass email trying to get feedback on our current uh, educational um, uh, assessment system. Um, and so I would uh, highly encourage folks, they, uh, they put together a set of, uh, uh, they were quite lengthy videos, but as they were dialoguing about our current assessment system, um, they are taking feedback. I, I've heard the possibility, and, and I think this is better, I, I don't know that it's the entire solution, but I've heard ideas such as assessing students uh, something more like beginning, middle, and the end of the year, rather than a one time. And so I think, uh, yeah, absolutely, with, uh, that, that is being addressed. It is being looked at. Uh, it's, a, it's a small committee. There's a, a group of folks. In fact, I will go back and uh, after the session, uh, I will tweet out um, something I would uh, uh, posted uh, uh, weeks earlier about, uh, uh, about the process that they're, that they're going through. Um, what I found a little bit disappointing was out of the, the groups of people that were uh, that are involved, we do have some uh, educational leaders and uh, uh, folks from the universities and um, other uh, business professionals making these decisions. I, I was a little dismayed that teachers weren't included uh, on that because I, I just think that we've got to listen 
um, to our teachers' voices. And, and, I, and I gave the analogy of the day as we were talking about uh, teachers in particular. Uh, when I go to the doctor, which I've done quite a bit lately, having just come out of surgery, I had never gone to the doctor's office and questioned his credentials uh, about what he was recommending that I do, and yet we do that to teachers so often. And I think it's critical for our teachers' voices to continue to be heard. And so what limited opportunity they've given us, uh, uh, the, uh, the, there is uh, opportunity to give feedback on that site. Uh, they limit the character count to 300. So use your, your it was uh, basically you're limited to two tweets worth of uh, feedback, but but use that to, use that as an opportunity to give feedback. I think that they've got to know, and I think that we can continue to use things like uh, Twitter and, and and social media and Facebook to uh, to get that uh, out there. So good. And thank, thanks for that question. What 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 other questions do we have at this point before uh, we uh, we bring that to a close? Yeah, I see a comment that came in about testing three times a year would be um, horrible, and and that's my uh, my fear uh, as well is is will that become test prep uh, year round? Um, you know, one of the comments I heard from a number of teachers this year uh, with the assessment dates being pushed back so far in the school year, uh, I've, I know a lot of teachers have uh, have used the opportunity of the month of May to go. Thank goodness we finally got through this uh, testing season and, and have done activities like they really want to do, such as project-based learning for kids. And I was asked to be a part of, uh, of a group that was studying, a uh, fourth grade group, in fact, that was studying about how to change school as we know it, putting that problem in front of a group of fourth graders. And I got to uh, work with them, and, and they were so... Uh, engaged throughout the uh, throughout my presentation, throughout the time that they were working on the units, as I checked in with them, uh, quite fascinating. And I know our teachers desperately want to be able to have those uh, freedoms to be able to go back and teach kids uh, in the way that they need to be prepared for uh, our new our new world, our 21st century, for sure. Any other questions? Well, I think as I, as I begin to wrap this up then, is my challenge to you is don't think of how it is, but how it could be. There is a little bit of a fear factor wondering what would education uh, look like. And I think that's where conferences such as this one that you all have, uh, have worked through, uh, where we begin to dialogue about things um, uh, about blended learning or project-based learning or uh, you know, as someone who has worked with students of poverty my whole career, um, I envision schools where um, they really are not just uh, the, the school, but really the uh, a community hub for our schools of poverty where there's access to medical services, dental services, mental health services, child care services, daycare services, a whole slew of things. Uh, library services that are available to kids and families around the clock, and not just in our traditional hours. And I, 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 I think it's ideas like that or uh, ideas of do we really want to make a kid who can learn algebra in two weeks sit there for two semesters? How can we let them move on? Um, and, and that's where a lot of the fear and anxiety comes in because in our current system of 50-minute blocks or an hour and a half blocks of, of time, that's not going to work. And that's why it's got to be uh, rethought of how we might be able to do it, which is why I leave you with this challenge of not thinking of how it is, but really how it could be. So I have a, a, a bit of contact information here. If anybody is uh, interested, I am always available to, to chat. I, I've had the, the, the opportunity to talk with educators uh, across the state. I've uh, done a, a number of, of presentations and continue to, uh, uh, to do so. And, um, uh, and, and in those times of, of, of talking to teachers and educators and districts, um, whether in district or, or whether I've been invited to a service center, I, um, I love to get out and, and talk with people and uh, sometimes folks have 
uh, you know, questions after the fact, and I'm always open to to be reached. Uh, so here at uh, my work number and um, my email address, cha at Denton ISD. Uh, to continue that dialogue, I think we've got to continue to have these types of dialogues. Um, I've actually, sorry, I've updated my uh, Twitter account to actually uh, reflect. Let me go back. Um, so I've updated that uh, account to uh, to actually be my Twitter handle as well as my Facebook. Uh, into my Facebook URL is um, is is now under whoseshade.com. Um, I uh, had uh, long wanted to to create a, a blog and uh, a repository for for some of the work that uh, that I've been able to do, and so I um, I've created a, a, a website um, that connects to my Twitter. Again, it's uh, under whoseshade.com. Uh, essentially, I uh, I began to think about what unique URL could uh, describe what I do, and as I as I pondered looking for that, because it's pretty hard to find a, a unique uh, .com today, um, I, I thought back to a quote that I'd heard about, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit, which is a take on the Greek proverb uh, that uh, is, is, uh, says a society grows great when old men plant trees under whose shade they shall never sit in. I really, uh, that really, Sparked uh, something within me, um, so it's uh, yeah. Here I'll enter it in the chat box under whose shade. I believe I have the longest Twitter handle uh, out there. It's a uh, I think it's a max of 15 um, letters, and I've taken all. So uh, please connect on uh, on Twitter. I will uh, go back and uh, uh, post um, the information I shared about the uh, the assessment process that our state is is uh, currently uh, taking a look at. Um, so uh, so check that out again. Uh, Twitter is the same thing at under whose shade so uh, yeah please uh, follow I'll follow back and let's uh, let's have some interesting dialogue and challenge the system as it is we do have another question um, Warren also asked how do we make change happen as individual educators you know that's a uh, so there's an activity that I've done and, and I've, I've, I've got a session coming up this summer to do the exact same thing and, and what I have have uh, folks do is to list out, and this worked great at the end of uh, school year when I first did it uh, in the month of May, which is what are all the things that are stressing you out right now about school? And so folks made a, a list of little one-by-one -one sticky notes uh, about all of those things. I gave them a couple of minutes to write those down, and then I had them draw uh, three circles uh, like the uh, target, like a target. And, and I had them place those, those stressors in, in one of three locations, the outer ring being the issues that uh, are uh, in the circle of, of concern, those are things that uh, we're really concerned about, but we really can't do a lot about right now. Um, in my circle of concern would be standardized assessment. I don't know that we really want standardized kids. Uh, I think we want to uh, celebrate diversity. I think we want to cultivate curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so in my circle of concern, I would put standardized assessment the uh, next inner circle would be that in the uh, circle of influence. And uh, those are things that we uh, can impact and begin to move forward as a group. And so I look to some of the work that I'm able to do in our district um, uh, as, uh, as one that's in charge of our district uh, site-based team and some of the work we're doing as a district of innovation uh, to, to say there are some things that we can do to impact. For example, uh, our, our Currently, our school district, I've uh, led the project with the help of our communications department and superintendent uh, and a few others to, we've designed an alternative accountability system in Denton. Um, so our intent is the, uh, well, we, we sent out 30,000 surveys across our community to find out what, what do you really value. Interestingly, uh, star scores were valued absolutely dead last. Um, having good teachers was uh, rated extraordinarily high. It was the highest rated. Uh, having kids have the opportunity to participate in the fine arts was huge, uh, which we weren't surprised about. Denton is a very artistic community. Uh, and so our intent is uh, we've created a set of metrics for um, uh, all of these areas, and there's a, there's a huge number of areas um, that, we, uh, that we looked at from learning um, and uh, student opportunities to um, growth and development and, and things like that. Our intent is to release 
a um, on the day that the state releases our uh, star scores, our accountability ratings, um, that we're going to hold the press conference the same day and say, here's what the state says, but local community, here's what you said. And we're going to educate our realtors in, into what really matters because our community shared what they valued. And, and then finally, that inner circle being the circle of, uh, of control, things that we can really do something about. I think that's really where it comes in for uh, our teachers and, and educators alike to uh, say, what can I do? And, um, and, and sometimes we are put in a position of having to forego good pedagogy to teach test prep, and that's part of our reality. But we don't have to do that all of the time. And I think what we have to consider is what are those things that are stressing us and which one of those circles uh, would that fit is and what is in my circle of control. Um, I can read the children. Uh, I can sit down and teach kids to find amazing books that uh, are of their interest level, things like that, um, and, and ways that we can be uh, engaging with our, with our kids. I think that's where we can look to what's in our circle of, uh, of, of control. What else do we have? Any other good questions? I, I think the process of change is, is a lengthy one. I think we're seeing uh, the beginning stages of it to, I think we're finding cracks in it. I think that families are coming together, uh, many wanting to opt out, challenge the system. Um, and 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 uh, I think that's where we got to begin to continue to inform uh, others as to what we're really what we're really up against um, here. Uh, Joe well, Claire, no, questions. Well, this is Joanne. Joe Claire, I just wanted to let you know that Chris does a fantastic presentation called Death by PowerPoint. I think you even have a sequel to that, and I've, I've actually been to that, and so that's where his graphic skills are really um, showcased. So I just wanted to let you know that if you ever get a chance to see him present that, you must go to it. Absolutely. We're, we're having our uh, technology uh, conference here in Denton in July the 19th and 20th. I'm actually presenting that again on the 19th. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of fun. I share uh, brain research behind presentations. I am not um, a, uh, I do not like wordy bullet points. I've done a lot of research over my time into developing engaging presentations. Uh, I presented in a couple of ways. One in the format like I've used today and uh, also um, for the, uh, the TED talk uh, that I got to do back in May, uh, I had to format it a little bit different. I had to pay more attention to Creative Commons and things like that. So I really uh, show folks uh, a couple of different ways to go about the presentation. So um, absolutely, I'll post that um, out um, on uh, Facebook and, and, and Twitter uh, for sure. Thank you guys for being a part of, um, of this time with me. I, I really honestly I believe in our educators. I believe in our teachers. I had an opportunity to, to have a, a multi-hour conversation just uh, the day before last um, about education with somebody that didn't have a great insight. And being able to educate him through the conversation, he walked away with a different light and had one perspective of how he perceived teachers and having talked to me, I really begin to change this paradigm uh, and really shift that. And I think that's, again, where part of, uh, part of my desire is to really get the word out of what we really deal with. Because folks often will see education through the lens of their one or, or two children. Uh, as a recovering principal, I'll say looking at a building of, of 500 or uh, as I was, or, or a building of uh, two or three thousand, as, as as others are, is a very different uh, perspective, and it's important to uh, educate our folks about the realities of the work of of our teachers because they are uh, truly a godsend. All right. Any other questions?
Well, thank you for having spent um, some time with me this morning. Again, don't ever hesitate to write or call. Uh, if you don't think I'll write you back, try me. <laughs>